Hello and welcome back to day 56 of Bitwise, where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, I think I said last stream that I wouldn't be doing another stream this week, but I lied. Um, I'm in Europe now, and um, I figured I would get in a stream so we get in our customary three a week. And it also lets me kind of round out the set of topics uh, related to arithmetic uh, circuits. Um, last time we covered multipliers and uh, spent a lot of time debugging some stupid stuff uh, that, that really had nothing to do with multipliers, it turned out. But um, I think we can call that, uh, even though there are other topics here that maybe I'll revisit in the future, like booth encoding, which is an important technique that's used in practice. Uh, I also didn't talk about how to do sign multiplication. Um, maybe I will have a bunch of sort of miscellaneous uh, follow-up topics to all the things we talked about in a future episode. But for now, I want to sort of round out these topics. And for the final topic, I'll cover dividers. Um, and so that's what we're going to do today. I haven't had a ton of time to think about what I uh, what I want to say necessarily. So I'm going to cover kind of um, some stuff that I feel, I guess, more uh, comfortable in. And then we'll do some stuff that's more exploratory which may end up uh, not working out uh, in this episode, but um, should hopefully be interesting. Um, so that, yeah, that's that's it for the for, for this set of topics, uh, hopefully this week. And then next week, I will uh, I will move to stuff that uh, sort of involves uh, sequential logic, like things that are based on state machines and stuff, things that change over time, as opposed to these sort of combinational circuits, which are uh, kind of the, the purely functional uh, side of, of hardware, I guess you could say. Um, so yeah, rounding that out today with dividers. Uh, a quick note on ours. Uh, I will be in Europe for the month of August. Um, probably not. So so right now I am um, right now I'm streaming at 3 p.m. Uh, Danish time, which is, I guess, uh, we're at one hour ahead of London, right? So it's uh, 2 p.m. in London. Um, I will probably move to a schedule which is um, late afternoon or early evening or something like that, um, my time. So expect the streams, I guess, to be maybe four hours after this normally. Um, but uh, depending on what people, um, I guess I'm pretty flexible with that. It's usually easier for me to do it in the evenings because that gives me the day hours to do family stuff. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, expect a general shift in hours for August and. Uh, We'll be back to the old schedule sometime in September when I return to Thailand. All right. So uh, to quickly recap what we did last time. Oh, actually, I have another note to make. Um, so we, I've been using C Python, you know, the sort of de facto standard implementation of Python. I've been using that for all my stuff so far. I realized the other day that as we were starting to run tests that took a bit longer to run, that it would be good for me to investigate if there were any issues getting PyPy to run with uh, the code we've written so far. Um, PyPy is a uh, highly kind of a highly optimizing JIT implementation of Python, and um, the reason I wasn't sure if it would work is I know that it lags the the it lags the latest versions a little bit, especially for Python three, uh, and so I wasn't sure if it had support for all the Python three. Uh, three five three six features uh, that we use and uh, it turns out it did have them uh, it, it supported them uh, very easily uh, so uh, just in case uh, you're wondering you I'm actually now running with I think this is running with uh, with PyPy it doesn't really say it down here but you can see it in the hover path that I'm actually using PyPy it also works even with the VS code debugging stuff so um, for some of the tests I did it ran like at least 10 times faster um, and uh, Anyway, yeah, so uh, just, just a heads up that uh, that will work, and we'll probably, once the, the, with the, the design we're doing started getting bigger, it will be even more useful to have that uh, speed boost. All right. Uh, but yeah, so in terms of what we did last time, we, uh, we did a multiplier or set of multiplier designs, um, starting with, um, you know, talking about, you know, generating partial products and uh, different ways of adding them, basically. So decomposing the multiplication problem into the generation of partial products um, and then adding them up. And for adding them up, we have a couple of different choices. We can do, well, we can, we can do really naive stuff like just linearly adding them in a single big chain, maybe even using a uh, ripple carry adder for each of them, uh, or better, which is what I still call naive multiplier. We can do a binary reduction tree, which has logarithmic depth, where each operation in that log depth tree is, is a, say, a ripple carry adder. 
um, if we do that, things are uh, actually pretty good because um, because of a couple of things. Even if you use a ripple carrying adder in this kind of binary reduction tree, the different levels of the tree can kind of start in a, with a staggered delay um, so that you don't have to finish everything in layer one before you can start layer two. As soon as the least significant bits of layer uh, of the first layer are finished, the next layer can be in be, can begin its first bit and so on. So you kind of get overlapping between the different levels. Which means that, for example, if you have a log depth tree, but you're using a linear depth uh, ripple carry adder, the actual depth of that combined tree becomes n plus log n, so it becomes dominated by the linear depth. It doesn't become, for example, n times log n the way you might naively think it if you think that each layer would have to complete before the next one can begin at all. So because of that kind of combinational pipelining effect, um, this is not as bad as you might think. Um, but then we move to... Um, to other approaches to summing those uh, partial products. Uh, the first is a naive array CSA uh, multi-adder. So the idea behind CSA, a so-called carry-save adder, is that it's a way to add three operands producing two operands such that you don't have to do any carry propagation at all. It's really just a, a set of uh, full adders uh, for each bit. So there's, there's constant uh, depth even for a very wide addition. Um, and so you can do a bunch of these, uh, and then at the end you're left with two operands because this doesn't this this lets you go from three to two. It doesn't let you go from two to one. And so for the final two to redu one reduction, when you do this, you, you use a normal uh, carry propagate adder like the ones we've investigated in previous uh, in previous episodes. So that was one approach. Um, and then you can take that idea even further and try to construct the minimum depth reduction tree um, using these CSA adders rather than having um, rather than using this sort of uh, array approach. And then you have a tree, and um, the conventional uh, thing you can do is called a Wallace, uh, a Wallace tree, uh, usually called a Wallace tree multiplier, but really the trick here is adding multiple terms in parallel uh, in, in a way that exploits the bit level parallelism. Uh, the multiplication is really just a, one of the standard applications, but it really works for any kind of multi-operand addition problem. And uh, we implemented this. This was sort of the thing that took a while to debug. The, uh, the actual algorithm, um, in essence, is not very complicated. You have a set of rounds, and each round you make as many reductions as you can within each weight. So you have a weight for every bit position, bit 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, each corresponding to a power of 2. Um, as long as you have three bits in a given weight, you can do a 3 to 2 reduction. If you have two bits in a given weight, you could do a 2 to 2 reduction where um, one of the bits gets pushed to the next weight, so it's a carry. Uh, if you only have one thing left over in a given uh, wait, then you just pass it through. But anyway, you keep doing these reductions until you're down to, um, at most, two bits per uh, per weight. And at that point, you can finish off, uh, as we did with the CSA array adder, the multi adder thing. You can finish off with a two to one uh, carry propagate addition using whatever you want. Uh, you know, for example, a fast logarithmic depth uh, prefix tree adder or something like that. Um, so that's what we did last time. Um, the uh, sort of delay, the delay uh, numbers don't quite tell the the true story, and uh, because the delay model is still very simplistic relative to real circuits. Um, but yeah, let me just co comment this actually, since we're going to be moving on from uh, from doing multipliers. But anyway, now that we've covered multipliers, um, and there will be some follow up topics, but um, I think this is enough to to give you the idea of how you can do very fast multipliers. Uh, I'm going to move to, you know, sort of the uh, the dual topic of dividers, which turns out to be um, much harder to do quickly. Um, and uh, indeed, even though there are theoretical uh, log depth circuits, it turns out that all the practical circuits, and even those require some tricks, are actually log depth squared. So for 64 bits, for example, they would be on the order of you know, six squared depth, uh, which is 36, rather than six depth or whatever. Um, and if you look at how long things usually take in real chips, uh, like the latency of integer addition or integer division in real chips, you'll see this borne out. So for example, you typically see uh, cycle latencies of three or four for multiplications for integers, but for corresponding division, it might be like 17 or something like that. So it, it, um, it really is, uh, it scales quite differently. Um, and so uh, I'll make some comments on why that is. Uh, I mean, I think everyone understands sort of intuitively that division is a harder problem than multiplication. It's not totally um, surprising that an inverse problem is harder than the forward problem. 
Um, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we will look at that today. Um, let's see here. All right, let's just jump right in. I'm going to turn on my room fan because it's boiling hot in here. Um, I'm sorry, it might make a, a low background noise, but um, it's hopefully not going to be too distracting. This thing, the minimum speed on this fan is like turbo speed, so unfortunately I can't um, can't rev it any lower. Um, all right, so the uh, the integer division problem. Um, the integer division problem. I'm going to first formulate it sort of in the textbooks way. Um, it, it is as follows, and we're going to be talking about unsigned integer division. We actually also didn't talk about signed integer multiplication. I will have some sort of follow-up topic on that to finish that off uh, in the future. But uh, for division as well, we'll just assume we're dealing with unsigned arithmetic. It makes it a little bit simpler, but it doesn't fundamentally uh, alter the problem. Like, for example, if you wanted to very inefficiently, uh, which is not really how most chips do it, if you wanted to do signed integer multiplication, you could convert everything to sign magnitude uh, and just do, you know, like negative times negative is positive and do those standard things to convert it to a standardized uh, uh, unsigned problem and then put the sign back in at the end. And you could do division basically the same way. So I'll just assume that we'll focus on the unsigned problem and uh, later maybe we'll talk about some some tricks to um, to handle signed uh, values with, without needless uh, cost. So, uh, but anyway, so, so, so suppose we want to divide... Um, uh, and I'll say n by d, so uh, just some mnemonic values. Uh, you can you can think of d standing as either for denominator or divisor. Um, this is uh, uh, find uh, find q and r um, such that n is q times d plus r. Um, this is really the division problem is you want to find a q which is the quotient of this division such as multiplying uh, the divisor by the quotient um, is within a certain remainder of the result so this is truncating division it's always this product here is always strictly less than or equal to n uh, and we want q to be the largest value such that we have a remainder that is in this range because if we uh, for any value uh, if if uh, if we compute this product and we're not, uh, and R is not in this range, uh, then you could you could increment Q and and make uh, R smaller, and you can basically keep doing that until you're in this range. That's the basis of the Euclidean algorithm for division. But uh, that that's the sort of I guess the you might say the number theory way of stating integer division. There's a another version of integer division uh, which turns out to be equivalent, but it uses uh, some other structure, and that's based on looking at integer division as a um, as a computation over the rationals, where you can, of course, you know, division is an actual operation that is the inverse of multiplication. The integer division is not the inverse of integer multiplication because of remainders. Uh, so another way of looking at this is that you're computing an exact rational quotient, and then you're truncating it to the nearest integer, or sorry, yeah, you're not the nearest integer, you're truncating it, truncating it downward to the nearest integer. That's another way of looking at the problem. But for now, uh, we will take the sort of the intrinsic integer point of view, which doesn't make reference to rationals and truncating rationals to integers or anything like that, we're just going to formulate it like this. And so, um, if if this is the problem you start with, let me just remind you of some standard algorithms for doing this. There is the kind of Euclidean algorithm, um, which is division by repeated subtraction, uh, and it goes basically like this. Uh, you you start with a a partial, so-called partial remainder, which uh, is a number that uh, is going to evolve throughout the computation and we will start it out equal to n um, and so uh, you start out with uh, r equal to n q equal to zero um, and I can actually I'm, I can write it in Python code uh, so that I, I don't have to use uh, pseudocode but you start out with r being the so-called partial remainder and so you can see here it's generally not true that it satisfies this condition but it will be true that um, that this equation holds because uh, you know zero times d uh, you know if I if I write this it just says zero times d plus n equals n and that's certainly true so basically throughout the uh, the iteration 
this equality will hold, but it won't necessarily be true, for example, well, actually, this is the primary thing that won't, this is the thing that won't hold. It won't be true that the remainder is in this range. Um, and so uh, you can really just use that thing to be the driving, uh, to be the driving, like you can basically say, while, uh, while r is greater than d, and this is just equivalent to not uh, to to the negation of this invariant that we're trying to establish, uh, you can increment q and you can decrement r by d. Um, and if it, you know, and you can show that this preserves the invariant because if I um, if if this thing previously held and I now do this. Um, you know, if you multiply this out, you can see that this is uh, q times d plus uh, plus uh, there's one of d. Uh, so this overall is the same. And so if the equality was true before, it's still true now. But we have now reduced r uh, by one copy of d, basically. And so if you do this repeatedly, um, you will eventually you will preserve the equality along the way and you will eventually get a, an R that actually satisfies the, the remainder invariant. So it stops being a partial remainder and is an actual remainder. And then at this point, you can return Q and R. So this is the Euclidean algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is sort of like if you're a mathematician or something like that, this is typically what you will learn just as a way of proving that you can in fact find a Q and an R that satisfies this. But of course, this thing is slow as, as heck because um, you know, you're, you're, you're subtracting one copy of D per iteration. So, you know, for example, if Q is some astronomical number like uh, 10 million, you're dividing two 32-bit numbers, this thing will take 10 million iterations. Uh, and each iteration would involve doing this comparison and the subtraction. So this is no good in practice. Um, uh, no good in practice uh, takes time linear and quotient, uh, magnitude of quotient. So um, this is this is a good kind of theoretical algorithm, uh, but no good in practice um, for computation. Uh, so of course, what you do instead <clears throat> is basically what we learned in middle school, which is long division. And long division basically finishes a digit per iteration. So um, we try to completely finish one digit and then move on to the next digit of the quotient. So rather than incrementing the quotient by one, we're going to basically finish a digit of the quotient per iteration instead. Um, and um, this is, I guess, it's um, it's a little bit easier to do. It, actually, it's quite a bit easier to do this in uh, binary than it is to do it in decimal, for example. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of stuff about that. But the basic problem when you're trying to do long division um, um, The basic problem when doing long division is to do what's called quotient estimation. So at every given point, you have to try to establish what the quotient digit is for the next step. Um, and uh, it turns out that over binary, that's very easy because there are only two d digit values. There's either zero or one. And you can establish that very easily by checking whether um, a, you know, a power of two multiple of the divisor um, uh, is greater than the remainder uh, that, that you're kind of trying to reduce. So you're going to still have a partial remainder, but each iteration you're going to try to make a lot more progress than just subtracting one copy of D. You're going to subtract some power of two of D. And so you're going to try to subtract the largest possible uh, power of two at the beginning, and then that finishes one digit, and you proceed to the lower digits progressively. Um, but in order to do that, you need to be able to ask, uh, to select the quotient digits. And like I said, for a binary, there's only two, two possibilities. If you're trying to do decimal, uh, where you have 10 possible digits, uh, you can just try every digit in turn. Like you can see, does, 10, does 9 times this go, go into this uh, thing you're dividing into, and so on. You can try all the digits. Or you can binary search on the digits, which actually works too. But it turns out if you do a binary search on, on the quotient digits, it's really just a slow way of doing binary multi uh, division. So anyway, and there are fancier ways to do that stuff, but uh, anyway, it will turn out that um, doing this stuff um, in binary is going to, to make it easier for us. 
And so uh, the idea we're going to apply is the following. Um, we start out as before with um, you know a partial quotient and a partial remainder. Um, so we have this initial equality. Um, and then what we're going to do is we are actually going to um, start with a multiple of the um, I'm going to have a trial divisor, which is actually a power of two multiple, and I guess I should call it like um, let m be the number of bits. Um, we're going to start with d. Basically, you can think of it as being shifted up by um, by m bits, so left shifting it by m bits. I'm going to write it algebraically, but this, you should think of this as being just a shift. And the idea is that this is going to be the largest multiple of d that can possibly di uh, divide into n because of this assumption that m is the number of, of bits that represent the numbers we're dealing with. Um, but then uh, other than that, it's basically going to be the same idea. Uh, now we're going to say is r larger than d, but d is not the original small d. It's going to be a, um, a much bigger d. Um, and so what we're going to do is we are going to, we're still going to do this and we're still going to do this, but um, at every step, we're actually going to multiply Q by two and then add this in. Uh, oh, and sorry, this is, let me write this a little bit differently. Um, so we're going to finish each of, we're going to try to establish each of the uh, digits in turn. So in every iteration, we shift over the, exi the existing quotient digits we established uh, and then depending on whether uh, the remainder is greater than D at this point, uh, we are going to we're going to increment Q. But because we are multiplying by two at every step, we're really just setting a, a mo more significant bit of Q and then we're kind of shifting them over. So this is like Q is acting as a shift register basically here, but I'm writing it algebraically as is conventional. Um, and so if this is true, then we, we subtract, we have the same basically increment and subtract approach here, but um, we're really handling things um, one digit at a time now because of the shift register logic. Uh, the other thing we then have to do is we have to divide D by, uh, by two in every step. So we try the largest possible power of two multiple of D the first step, then we try the one that's one smaller than, or that's one factor of two smaller than that after that. And so basically in the first step, we're trying to divide N by D times two to the M. In the next one after that, we're dividing N by, or we're dividing the remainder after that step by D times two to the M minus one and so on until we eventually get down to just D itself, the original D uh, to finish off the last quotient. Digit. So that's the idea. Um, and uh, if you write this out with uh, sort of with bit shifting logic, you instead get, um, um, you instead get something like this. Uh, this here becomes uh, a shift like this, and this becomes a shift like this. Um, and this, these things both look correct. Although I guess it should be noted that rather than looking at this as an addition, you should really look at this as just being kind of a bit set because I don't want you to think that this thing here actually involves a carry propagation. Since we're working in binary, this is just really setting that bit. So I'm going to write this just to emphasize that we're really doing a bit set. We're not really doing a carry propagate addition um, because we've shifted it over at this point. Um, and uh, this part here does have to be a, a true subtraction. Indeed, this it, it turns out that uh, one of the things that's really hard to overcome in terms of serial execution in these types of algorithms is the fact that you're doing these comparisons and um, you know not, not to anticipate what we'll be covering in the future too much but th this will turn out to be one of the major bottlenecks are, are these comparisons and uh, these subtractions they really do have to be carry propagate uh, in this formulation there turns out to be a looser formulation called SRT division which sidesteps, side, sidesteps some of that but anyway um, let's try before we go in and implement this in hardware uh, let me actually just try implementing it as a sort of software algorithm like in, in Python just as something that can execute like normal Python code and we will verify that the algorithm works because uh, once we verify that it works sort of in software the algorithm in hardware won't be substantially uh, different so um, and, and we will as before we'll test it with you know we'll do a brute force test uh, using um, you know say four bits or whatever 
Okay. So, um, so I will call this uh, Euclidean divider or Euclidean divide MD, or what did I call it? NND. Um, Actually, and let, let me implement just, just to show you, even though this algorithm is really just sort of a reference algorithm, it's not something you want to use, um, it's by far the easiest to understand, I think. Um, uh, I'm just going to return Q. Uh, you can always compute R given Q and N and D by just, um, in case that isn't obvious, um, uh, you can always compute R as N minus Q times D. So if so, N and D are given in the problem, if someone gives you a purported Q, you can always compute the, the corresponding remainder, or you can actually check whether it falls in the valid range, check whether it's a valid remainder or not. So one interesting fact of this algorithm is that it's sort of self-certifying. If you execute, if you evaluate this expression, uh, you can tell whether someone gave you the real quotient or not, interestingly. Um, all right, um, so this is... Uh, this is Euclidean divide, and um, I guess uh, I'll call binary divide. Um, same kind of algorithm, um, and um, I guess in this algorithm I will have some num bits type of thing. Um, and then. Um, in this case, we will have, well, yeah, I guess we have the same thing. Uh, if this thing is greater than or equal to D, then um, basically we will uh, we will set one bit of the quotient and then like that. Um, and here it might be useful to just assert, because note that here this algorithm is, is driven by the remainder invariant. It, says, it basically says as long as the remainder invariant isn't satisfied, we will make some progress towards satisfying it, and the loop only stops when this is satisfied. So whatever else is true, clearly when we're done here, you know, it, it's, it's certainly tr true that this is the case. Uh, well, actually, if you want to be pedantic, I guess if we made a mistake, you could somehow end up negative, which would be an error. But... Um, I guess let's be very explicit about this. Um, and you can even put in the full, uh, you know, you can, you can put in, you can put in this actually. Um, so let's just do that just to sort of express, uh, express those final invariants we want satisfied. Um, all right. So um, let's, I, I guess we can kind of do it here. Um, um, so, um, this is ND and here we don't need to know the number of bits. Um, and then we will assert that, um, this is equal to and keep in mind in Python 3, they made this decision to require you to use the double slash if you want truncating integer division. If you use single slash, you get floating point, um, which I'm not totally a fan of, but uh, in any case, uh, remember that. So uh, let's see if this works. And if it doesn't, then my my brain is fuzzy. And uh, this might actually yeah, take a while um, because this algorithm... And this could be because of many reasons. Let me just see if it's actually looping inside a single iteration. Yeah. Okay. You can't divide by zero because you're never going to make progress. So let's not divide by zero. Um, <laughs> uh, I could detect that inside the function itself, but... Um, Okay, so so this algorithm works. Um, let's test that the uh, sort of binary long division uh, algorithm works as well, which is you know le less likely to work correctly. Um, okay, yeah. So now we have to put in the number of bits, which is n. Okay, so there's an error. One divided by one should be uh, one. Hopefully Python agrees, uh, but we're getting zero. Um, uh, 
let's see what's let's see what's going on. Um, so number of bits is four. This is okay. Um, let me let me just break that out. Uh, like I'll I'll just do this here as a specific case, just so I can easily uh, step to it. So one one, and then we shift it over by that, which is should be sixteen now, right? Uh, and then for each bit, um, we shift the existing thing over. We say is r greater than um, than this, and certainly that won't be the case for a while. So what I'm forgetting is I should be shifting over d by one because we start with the largest possible multiple that could divide into n, and then we try smaller and smaller powers of two after that. Um, so this is the initialization, and this is the forward shift. Um, okay, that doesn't work. Um, so this is a... Uh, so what is it purporting Q to be? It says Q is zero. Okay, so that still didn't work. But um, So let's see why that is. Um, it's because it actually needs, no, th I think that is right. Um, if R is greater than D, greater than or equal to D, um, okay, that never triggers. So I guess, um, let's see here. Um, the last value of d at this point is 1, r is 1, so it's almost like the final iteration never executes, so maybe there's an off by 1 in some of this stuff. So uh, d is 16, and now d is 8. Um, Now d is 4. Now d is 2. And then it's done. So I guess we just need an extra iteration there. Okay, so here we make. So now q is 1, and. We get that. <laughs> Wait, why is this not true? N is... Oh, D got shifted down to zero. Um... I mean, maybe I should call this something else to just to avoid confusion. Um, like, uh, maybe I'll call it D2. So the thing you're comparing to is D2. The thing you're shifting is D2, but you're still using the original D uh, for that step up there. Okay, so that works. Um, Actually, I, no, sorry. I, I actually, I see the original. I think the, the problem is actually this. This this should be the correct change, now that I think about it. Because you can't represent the, you know, for example, this would be time 16. So this is one bit more than you can actually represent. So I think this, yeah, this, would, this is the correct thing. Um, all right. Um... So that's binary division. Um, there is one 
optimization you can do here, I think, where um, if you look at what we're doing here, there's actually kind of two shifts going in different directions. We have this initialization, that is what it is. But then we're, we're both shifting the quotient leftward while shifting D rightward. Um, one thing you can do instead, um, <clears throat> Let me keep the original and change it so that we have one working version. Um, and this is the version that to me is always like a little bit less natural for some reason. Like the version I wrote up here to me is the natural adaptation of Euclidean division, just using bigger multiples, you know, power of two multiples of D rather than D itself. So you can make more rapid progress. Um, but what you can do instead um, is I'm not mistaken. Let me think about this. Um, I think if you mm, Um, maybe this doesn't really help here. If you multiply the remainder every step, um, then you can remove this. So instead of shifting this over, you can shift this over. Uh, and if you think about it, this has the same effect on the, um, this has the same effect in terms of the relative magnitude of D2 and R, like rather than shifting this down, you can shift this up. Um, but I guess if you do that, you have to kind of do it like this. Um, well, Let me see, what, what should I be subtracting from? Hmm. Let's see here. So this thing is not going to be true the same way anymore because now things have been shifted. Uh, but we still know what the right result is from by virtue of this. Uh, let's see if I got that right. Otherwise, I'll have to think through it. So 2 divided by 1. Yeah. Makes more sense to me that you do this afterward. To be honest, this version. All right, let me actually think through it rather than just bumbling my way through it. Um, okay, so you do the same thing we did before. You compare. So previously we were shifting over D to the right by one. Here we're shifting over R to the left. Um, okay, I should be subtracting. I don't know why I wasn't doing that. It's definitely one of the bugs. Okay, right, that's the algorithm that works. Um, 
we can't put in this because now r is not the original r it's the shifted r but basically yeah so this is just the same thing but instead of shifting d down we shift r up um, but one nice property of this which is used in hardware is that you can put q and r in a single shift register because basically as you are using up um, as you are using up values like as as q grows right so q grows one di one bit at a time in the shift register as q grows um you need less and less of the remainder because you finish off um like this thing shifts up so you can imagine if if you imagine a shift register i haven't defined what a shift register the shift register is just a register where you, you can shift bits over by one every cycle um Imagine you have a single shift register that starts like this. So in the higher bits, you have R. In the lower bits, you have Q. So in the initial step, all the bits are occupied by R. Um, and this bit, I should say that this bit register has width 2N, where N is the number of bits. Then every step, as you shift things over, you get, you get uh, quotient bits coming in from the bottom. Uh, and then you get essentially digits bits of r coming out the top but the top, the bits of r coming out the top are basically zeros because uh it's assumed that uh well you can actually divide into a double width numerator in which case real bits would be coming off of that um but let's not worry about that for a sec but that's basically the idea is you have a, a unified shift register um where um, so that's sort of partitioned into two parts and as bits of r being you're finishing with those bits they're coming off of one end you make room for the quotient bits in the bottom end and so after in iterations of this the lower half of that shift, shift register are the final bits of the quotient um just once we get to i guess we'll do fancier hardware implementation um this will become more useful uh for now though you can just see this as a uh, basically a transformation of this algorithm that avoids having two independent shift directions um, by by choosing what you shift uh, from, from one to the other, from, from being uh, D2 to uh, being shifted down, from R2 now being shifted up. That's the idea. Um, all right. Um, so um, with this in hand, we can actually make a uh, an implementation. I don't know how obvious it is. So um, maybe I will call this uh, software. I'll just call this software divide. Uh, just to emphasize that these are sort of software algorithms, but I will still keep them in the test harness just as uh, sort of reference implementations. Um, um. Okay, so let's do a hardware implementation of this algorithm here. So what do we have to do? Um, we have to be a little bit more explicit about what we're dealing with. So um, let's just call this a binary divider. And so we get an N and D. Um, and um, we're not going to make this a multi-cycle circuit. Like everything we've been doing before, I was talking about shift registers and stuff like that. But imagine this is just a... Um, uh, like you do everything in one cycle, so it's just a big combinational circuit uh, that of the sort we've been doing so far. So, uh, so what what do we really have to do here? Well, we're still going to have these different things, um, and the way I'm writing it might not be the most efficient way to write it, um, sort of in terms of how the hardware is synthesized, but um, it's the most direct translation. So let's just use this for now. Um, the idea is going to be the same. We are going to have this kind of value, and we are going to have all this sort of stuff here. Um, it's just that, well, okay, let's, let's see. So we're going to, um, one thing we're probably going to be doing differently is that this, this kind of stuff here is basically going to be a bit vector concatenation. So um, we are going to have a Q. Um, can't remember did i put in support for length zero bit vectors i think i was th this is one case that i didn't handle originally i think we have it now so one thing you can do is you can start with a bit vector of length zero um i can't even remember like i said if how well i support that but that's the easiest way to initialize so even though i'm s saying this is zero it's really like you know there is no value in it um but it's the easiest way to initialize it 
Um, and then we have we have a remainder, which is indeed n. Uh, and we have d, I'll call it d2, which is going to be basically the double width version of it. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take d uh, as the, uh, I'm going to concatenate a bunch of lower bits here, basically. So I'm going to take as many bits as there are in d itself. Um, and I'm just going to make a bunch of zeros with that. That's conceptually what we're doing here. Uh, that's what the shift means, right? These are the this is the concatenation operator for bit vectors. This is how you fill the lower bit. So this is equivalent to doing that. I guess maybe we have to do minus one. Let me think about that. Um, if you shift over by one, yeah. So I guess it's something like this. Um, and then we have this iteration, and this is a static loop, right? Because it's based on um, It's uh, based on the, what you want to call it, the, the shape of the vector. It's not based on runtime data. So if you looked at something like this algorithm here, this algorithm would not be amenable to a combinational implementation as is. You can use this algorithm to do a multi-cycle implementation where every cycle you ask, you know, is this true? Uh, if not, then we do another loop. And if, if it is true, then we're done. But if you're doing this kind of combinational interpretation, the problem with this thing is it a priori has an unbounded number of iterations. One of the nice things about this for a combinational circuit is that it has a fixed number of iterations. Uh, it does mean that in some cases it could take longer than this one would. Like this can finish in one iteration, even for a 32-bit quantity, if it finds that um, you know, it, it, the quotient is equal to one, for example, or something like that. Uh, all right, so um, we do the same thing we were doing before. And now Q, when we do this left shift here, what we're really doing, I suppose, is, uh, actually, let me write it a little bit differently. Uh, we're still going to do this here. Um, and actually, I probably have to do an explicit zero extension to even do this comparison. So um, actually, and since we're shifting this over by one, let me, um, Let me uh, write it like this. So we're going to, you know, we're going to make these two vectors the same length. Since we're going to be comparing them, and they're going to be sort of shifting. Um, but while this one has lower bits equal to n, and then just is sort of zero extended upward, this one is kind of the the, the mirror image, I guess. It has n and d in the higher bits and zero in the lower bits. So anyway, so now these are the same shape, and we can actually do this comparison. But we can't do it uh, quite like this. We have to use when. So we have to say, basically, there are two things that can change in the iteration. Um, there is uh, Q and R. So these are kind of the loop variables. Um, and I'm going to be using, the, using this tuple version uh, of when, which is just really applying when to each entry of the tuple separately. Um, if R is greater than or equal to D2, then the next Q is the old Q with a one as the least significant bit. Um, so one is a length one bit vector. We concatenate it to Q. We set that as the new thing. Uh, and in this instance, we have to subtract D2 from R. Uh, but if if it is not true, then we have to get a zero digit for that. Uh, and R just gets passed through without a subtraction. Uh, and then finally, at the end here, we're done. Um, um, and the thing to note here is that um, while R stays the same throughout the iterations, it has the same shape, the same type, uh, this iteration here actually changes the type of Q successively. So it starts out as being uh, a zero length vector, and then we concatenate bits onto it progressively. Um, and this is basically just implementing the same kind of shift logic, but extending the length of the bit vector as we go. So something like this should work. So let's try making a, um, so that would be example 36. Um, well, let's just call it X the way we have been doing it um, for the interface itself. So, uh, Well, actually, let's say ND. Let's just use this convention. So this is going to be the result of N divided by D. 
Um, let me just verify that this has the right length. Actually, it may not. No, I think it should. Yeah, but let's just verify it because it's sort of inferred here. So let's just be explicit about it. Um, let's see if that circuit can first be constructed, uh, and it can be. Um, and now let's basically do the same thing here, but using the um, um, using the circuit instead of uh, the software code. It was 36, right? Just check. Yep. Um, this may not work, but we will see. Okay, did not work. Zero divided by one. Um, so this should be zero. Oh, yeah, we always have to ask for this. So you can get back multiple outputs. Okay, that didn't work. One divided by one, and it claims it's zero. Um, let me show you the tracing in action. Um, So we can see what's going on here. Um, there's probably something stupid, like an off by one or something like that, um, in the bit vector widths. But um, in order to get the actual trace code included in a given compilation, you have to pass this uh, trace equals true flag. Um, I think. What's um, okay? So when you do a trace, it's always included, but it's okay. So it's the runtime. There's two kinds of traces. There's the brute force where you trace everything, but yeah. Then there's the per invocation. All right, um, so R is one, it's the thing you're dividing into, or sorry, that's the, no, that is the thing you're dividing into. Um, I see. Oh, I think I see one issue. I'm not. Um, I have to shift R over, which I'm not doing. So I have to. Uh, well, if you take this description literally, I guess it would be like this. you could you could also just oops you could write it I guess more uniformly like um, like that okay so now R is at least shifting over one two four eight um, and the thing you're dividing into is one but even the very first iteration Um, maybe this is where my my off by one was actually not an off by one. Let me just see that. Let's 
So let's see, this is 2 divided by 1, so this should be 1. Um, somehow we're getting back 3. That's interesting. <sighs> so n is 2, and this is 1. And so we start out with one, I guess one times eight as the largest possible thing that can divide into it. Oh, this wrapped around. Why would this wrap around? This looks like it's somehow an unmasked That's 56. So, um, so R is 8, and now you should be subtracting that from, or you should, should be subtracting D from that. D should be 8 itself. Um, I guess let me just trace that as well. How will we how will we handle floating point numbers with floating point arithmetic? Like we will have to implement that ourselves uh, eventually, but we won't be doing that right now. That's a more advanced topic. Um, okay. So what was the D two? The D yeah the D two is eight, and so n starts as two, and then we shift it up, and as soon as we get to Eight. Now it's greater than or equal to, so it should be eight minus eight is zero. And at that point, there should be uh, no remainder. Somehow we get this big value. Um, just interesting. Wonder what's going on there. If r is greater than or equal to d2, then do this subtraction. Um, This is a case where it's wrapping around because I'm. Okay, where were we? I really don't think that's the issue. So D here. Let me let me let me try writing it more like the software algorithm, just to sort of delta debug it versus that. And then I'll turn it back into something with bit vectors, something more bit vector centric. Um, so then I take this like that, and I take this, oh no, I see the issue, well, um, I'll say these are double width, uh, then for D, you shift this over by 
length of D minus one. Um, and then for these steps, rather than doing this concatenation, I think this part's actually probably fine. It's fascinating. Um, this should be basically the same values. But let's see, just to check my sanity. Really don't understand why. So D2 is 8. You've got pre R of 8. This should just be 8 minus 8, which is 0. Somehow we're getting that. Because the comparison is, is versus this, so it says if r is greater than or equal to d2, then subtract d2. In this case, it's equal to that, so you subtract them. Um, Ugh. These pop-up notifications are so obnoxious. Just hang on. This must be something weird in the synthesis code. Um, let me just test that theory. It's probably going to be hard to read the code, but... Um, Let's just turn this off for a sec so I can see the code. Um, boom, boom, boom. Obviously, this code is not the easiest to read. Okay, so these are eight bits. Then, so this is the comparison, T22. Which is, I guess, R. Or, um, obviously there's multiple iterations of this. And then it does this minus. What is this horse shit with the minus? That's baffling. Shit, I know what that is. We're not. I actually don't know why that is happening. Why would it not?
pretty bizarre, I think. Um, Bitwise Ops. Oh shit. That's very dangerous. Um, <laughs> let's see what that is. It's because it's it's saying that it sees this minus as a unary minus. Um, I guess, how do I distinguish that? Um, Okay, I see what that is. That's a compiler bug. Let me just fix that. Um, but to fix that, um, maybe I should change this setup a little bit so that um, Uh, op to Python. Rattle op to Python op. Um, actually, we can do that better by just doing this. Um, Okay, so. so now this gets detected correctly. Let me also just verify that unary minus makes its way through. Or can we do something weird like this? Okay, of course that won't work, but we should be able to see the unary minus somewhere. Am I missing it here? I don't see it. R should be minus N. And so that should be this shit. And then T. So that part definitely is happening. Then why am I not seeing 
any Yari minuses. Okay, now it's here. Because I just missed it the first time. Or I didn't or I didn't save that file correctly before rerunning. Alright, so that looks reasonable. Um, and now back to to this. Okay, it works. So um, this was I mean, this this is how we find bugs, right? So don't regret it because that needed to be fixed eventually. But uh, it did mean we end up spending a lot of time on stuff that has nothing to do with the vision, but that's how it goes sometimes. So let's remove this junk. Um, verify it still works. Um, and I think this should also now be able to work with half width. Yep. Um, all right. And I think if I wanted to, I could express this as n extended with this, and conversely, just go back to my original formulation. Um, not because it's necessarily better, but uh, just to prove that it works. Okay. And we need to take that out as well. All right. Um, okay, let's also take out that trace. Actually, let me get rid of that D2. Actually, let's keep it since we have it in the other circuit. So let's keep them consistent. Um, One thing you'll note, by the way, is that the final shift here is not really necessary. So I think sometimes you see implementations move it somewhere else. But in our case, since it, our stuff is output driven, since no one ever, ever references this final shift, it just is essentially free. It never existed as far as we're concerned. All right. So that's um, that's a binary division now in a circuit form. Um, this is called, uh, what is it called? It's called uh, restoring division. And um, I guess one thing you, you may note is that um, I guess we haven't really implemented uh, signed comparison operators. Well, we've shown how to implement it ourselves using sign extended subtractions and looking at the sign bit. But um, the built-in operators don't work like that, so we can't use that per se. But um, one one thing that you should note that this is sort of stand out. Uh, there's a couple of things that people usually do from this to optimize it while basically doing the similar kind of algorithm. Um, one of them is that um, you can basically share the code between um, this comparison and this subtraction, because really what you could do instead is you could write something like this. Um, and then you could say basically if this is you know if you look at what this says this is the same as saying if this is greater than zero uh, in order to do that correctly though you really have to handle uh, sign bits correctly um, so let's see if this works um, we will do it like that uh, I guess I'll say it when not. I mean, we, we can totally flip the. Let's see if we can get it working. Actually, let me let me leave the original. As always, let's make new versions rather than destructively changing the old versions, so we uh, we can see the changes. Um, and I won't I won't make new examples. I'll just change the existing ones because these are similar enough that. Um, so anyway, this is. Um, so this is one thing you can do, which which just kind of shares, I guess, circuitry between the comparison and the subtraction. And so you do them like this. Um, and uh, then you have to, I think it would be like this. Uh, and of course, instead of this, you can just write the same mux, but with the branches reversed. But let me just see if this works before we even start thinking about that. Yeah, that doesn't work. Um, all 
I mean, equivalently, you could write equal to zero. So that's equivalent. Um, um, let me think about what might be happening here. So this is going to be treated as a two's complement thing. Could also be, we probably need the extra bit for this, to be honest. Yeah, that's not what I wanted to write. That doesn't work. Let's see what the problem is. Zero divided by nine. So that should give zero, but we're getting 14. And that's because uh, r minus d2, so r in this case would be, well, what was the thing? Zero divided by anything. So r would be zero. Um, r minus anything is going to be negative. Um, D2 is this large thing. Let me think about whether we have enough bits to do that correctly. Um, I think, okay, let me do it like this. I need a zero here. Something like this, maybe. Okay, let's think through this. So do we have enough bits to do this without overflow? So we put a, an extra bit here. Um, so when you do this subtraction, um, this was for zero and one, so it would be R is zero all throughout. D is a bunch of zeros, then a one, and then that. When you subtract oops, two, oh well, I guess this has the wrong sign. Okay, so this works. <clears throat> okay, so instead of writing it like this, you can just reverse the branches. Um, so let's do that. So, so in case you didn't notice the bug there, the bug was I, when you're doing the subtraction, in order to do that and get the correct sign from the sign bit of the difference, you need an extra zero extended thing. Otherwise, you can overflow, in which case the top bit doesn't signify what you think it does. Uh, it needs to be a reliable indication of the sign of the difference. And so we had to zero extend. Uh, this case. And then I added an extra bit here, which is equivalent to zero extending that as well. Um, but anyway, then given that, um, you can you only you don't need to do a comparison separate from the subtraction. You just do the subtraction and you say if that subtraction uh, gives a negative gives a non-negative result, then we we use that basically. Otherwise, we use the old one. So. Um, Um, th th this is the the first order optimization you should be doing, even if you're using this algorithm. Now, the the next problem. So this is what's called restoring division, and let me just bring up the Wikipedia page uh, to to make sure that I'm using the right terminology, which is very. Uh, let's see here. I think this is the algorithm we have. Um, this is called restoring division. Basically, the idea is that at every step, we have the invariant that the remainder is between. Um, basically, we never let the remainder go negative, right? Like we the, the, we guard we we do this comparison 
uh, based on the result of the of the thing. Um, and so we never let the remainder go negative. This 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 basic check here, in fact, ensures that because the sign is the sign bit. So we don't we use R2 if R2 is negative. So this is called restoring division. Uh, the problem with this is it has this uh, subtraction, this full subtraction, carry propagate subtraction on the critical path um, of the MUX. And so um, one thing you can do instead is called non-restoring division. And basically what you do is at every step you base um, so let me say this is restoring division. Uh, and I am going to keep that separate. I'm going to have a separate example for uh, non non restoring division. Um, but I'm going to start with this code. I wanted to have this as an intermediate step just because you, you want to be doing the subtraction stuff with the non-restoring divider as well. So um, let me just already fill in this test case so we can start uh, testing it immediately. So far, we haven't touched anything, so these tests should pass. So basically, the idea is you actually allow the uh, you allow the remainder to temporarily go positive, or, or sorry, to go negative, but only sort of it's only ever off by one. <laughs> it's only ever off by one step. So basically, what you want to do is you want to make a distinction based on R. So you allow R to go negative, um, and the idea is if R is negative, then um, you try to make it positive. You try to add D to make it positive. And so at every step, instead of either, you know, in the, in the old algorithm, the two possibilities is we did this, uh, we did the subtraction, we looked at the sign of the subtraction. If it was non-negative, we kept the subtracted values. Otherwise, we kept the original value untouched. Here we're basically going to be either adding or subtracting uh, D in every step, or D2, I suppose, not D. Um, and um, no, I guess that's not totally true. Let me just remind myself. No, you are. You are going to conditionally add or subtract. <clears throat> um, and you're going to do that based on the current sign of R. So this decision is not on the critical. Um, the thing that this is conditioned on is not on the critical path the way it was before, which means that you're always kind of late by one. In the next iteration, you will know whether the subtraction you did the previous step made it negative. But you're not going to first do this you're, in the current step. You're not going to do the subtraction and then wait for that to settle so you can look at the sign bit and then make a decision about what to do this step. So you're always behind by one, but you can always correct in the next iteration. So if you did the subtraction this iteration and you went negative, you can add it in the next ter time to make it positive. And so it will sort of alternate around zero, always being off by at most one iteration. But that removes this subtraction from the critical path for the for the mux decision, uh, and then this does mean that at the end um, you have to do some extra things in order to get the result in a conventional notation. Um, like basically at every step, since you're you're not in the old step, you're either producing a quotient digit of zero if you're not s subtracting d, or you're it's one if you did subtract d. But here you can either add D or subtract D, so effectively you have either digits that are plus one or minus one, um, and um, that changes. Like that's obviously not the standard representation. So in then order to convert to standard two's complement, there's a final conversion step at the end. I'll talk about that when we get there. But that's just to tell you the logic is we want to get the the full carry propagate subtraction for the sign bit uh, check. We want to get that off the critical path. Um, we're still going to. So now what we're going to do basically is we're going to uh, have R2, which is going to be the new R, it's going to be either R plus, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to write it using algebraic notation, but I want you to remember that it's very easy using a single adder circuit to conditionally add or subtract by a value because it's equivalent, and two's complement is equivalent to conditionally negating 
the thing you're adding or subtracting and then conditionally having a carry of zero or one. We already did that earlier. So I just want you, I'm going to write this as, you know, being adding or subtracting a value, but really the point is this is really one circuit. I just want you to keep that in mind. Uh, I just don't want to sort of get that into the mix while we're at, while we're at it here. Um, so uh, if this thing is negative, then we want to add uh, D2. Otherwise, we want to subtract D2. Um, and if we add it, oh, so this is if, is if, if it's negative. If it's negative, then we want to add. And we're going to represent a subtraction as a digit of 0, but it really means minus 1. And we're going to reinterpret those bits at the end. Um, so I think that's it. So, I'm sorry. 1 times Q, and then this is like that. And I guess we still have this shift as we did before. But now the final step, and maybe I think Wikipedia has a decent explanation probably. So uh, this Q here represents this non-restoring division quotient where the one with the bar on top means a minus one was, uh, this corresponds to a minus one, means that in that step we subtracted D rather than adding D. Um, if you encode this in a mask where these one one bars corresponds to zeros, then you can produce the negative mask by just negating this bitwise. And so then what you want to do is just take the original mask minus the bitwise negation of the original mask, and that gives you the final sort of conventional two's complement mask. Mm -hmm. And so basically uh, the final result is going to be something like this, uh, if we did it correctly. But let me just uh, check through the logic before we get that far. This is low probability. I've never implemented this, by the way. I, I, so, so we will probably have fun debugging this. Um, zero divided by one. This should give zero, obviously, but it's giving one. Um, let's see here. Let's see if the so R should start out having. Uh, it should start out being positive. So in the first step. Um, this thing should, like, this sign bit should be zero, right? And so we should be doing this. Um, and so we get a sign bit of one. I mean, yeah, so that's what they're saying. Um, and then you subtract D2 from R. But then in the next step, so, wait, what, what were the values? Um, just to remind myself, was it one and zero? Zero and one. So in that case, D2 should be eight. D2 should be eight. And so basically what you can do at every step is you can sort of add or subtract eight. Um, So first step, you get a minus one in the mask. Okay, well, this is definitely wrong because this should be the value here. So that could be one bug. So they just, okay, one. Okay, so that's still get 15, which is minus one modulo that. Um, Just think this through carefully. When the partial remainder is negative, then we add in a copy of D2. And we set the quotient bit into 1, but this really means plus 1. When it's non negative, then we subtract, which will. In can make it negative in the next iteration. 
so in our case, um, since we start with n is equal to zero, this thing is going to start as being zero. After this first step, r is going to be minus eight. And um, well, you know, let's just trace this. Of course, minus eight may not be visualized. Like it, it's probably going to be 15. Let's see. Or my, minus eight is not 15, but it's going to be something that's going to be shown as an unsigned number. So I may want to take that into account. Um, okay. Let's try that. So 240, um, two forty eight. Anyway, so zero one three. So this is two ones. Um, It has four bits total. Okay, so that's how we get seven. So let me think, what would I expect to happen here, just from first principles? I guess I would expect it to be like, what was it? Um, so it's one div or zero divided by one. So you have, what is it, d2 is eight. So you say, um, you know, r is greater than zero, which means that we now go r minus eight. Then you say r is this, and so we add in four, which is minus four, and this is still negative. So you add in two. Um, And this is still uh, this is still negative, so you add in one, and now you're at minus one. And so, from most significant to least significant digit, it's only the first time we subtract. So I would expect it to be like this. Um, I guess there's an, it feels like there's an additional iteration here at the end we have to do that we don't normally have to do. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we subtract first, everything else is added. And so if you do this minus this, um, well, that gives us something negative for the, for, for one, which is what we were seeing in fact. Um, do we need an extra iteration at the end? 
Let me see what they say here. Oh, I guess another different thing is they pre-shift by R. Oh, right. Yeah, so that was what I was seeing. Okay. So there is a final polish off iteration, which is why we, we had the minus one here. That's why I was confused, because we'd already done four iterations for the four bits, but we still had minus one. It should go down to zero at this point. So, okay, so th that's uh, a missing a missing step, is at this point, if, um, if the remainder is still negative, okay. Um, If it's negative, then you have to subtract one. Okay. We write it like this. So we can trace this if we need to. So now we're getting 14. Before we were getting 15. Is it really minus one or is it plus one? Shouldn't this be plus one? So I mean, this this is clear to zero. Okay. Probably spend more time thinking about this before. So an another thing I notice is that. In their formulation of the algorithm, if I do this, probably other stuff has to change as well. So they say if r is negative after you're done with this iteration, I guess one thing that would change relative to what I was looking at is that I had the, the post shift. So now that we're doing the pre-shift, maybe this will change. Well, I'm willing to try, since I don't claim to fully understand the nuances of this, as well as I should, apparently. So this is giving us 1. It should be 0. If R is negative at this point, shouldn't you be adding, not subtracting? Something I don't understand. Okay. Let's try to make things as much like their algorithm as possible. So they are not shifting. They're shifting by by the full length, which is this. Mm. 
me go back to my code that I actually understood a little bit better. So I understand this part. This is just this part here is just equivalent to interpreting the the ones as ones and the zeros as as minus ones. So once you do the bitwise negations, the zeros becomes ones, the ones become zeros. And when you then do the twos complement subtraction, this I understand how this conversion works. Um, then for the restoring step, if this was another restoring step, normally when this thing when this thing is negative, you do a a plus one to Right? Even they do that. Oh no. I guess that's true. If something is negative, yeah, when it's negative, you add something. So shouldn't this be plus one? That really, to me, seems like the logical thing. When the remainder is negative, you have to add something to make it positive. The way they're doing their digit interpretation seems backwards. Hmm. This doesn't make sense. If 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 it's yeah, so I understand why okay, if it's non negative then you subtract. But wouldn't you set this thing to be minus one, not plus one? I feel like this is the way they're out writing the algorithm is wrong. But on the other hand my code isn't working, so who am I to say? So this to me that makes sense. I use this notation. This is the positive mask minus the negative mask. And then if this is negative, then I do a final plus one corresponding to the fact that um, you know you're adding one copy of the denominator, otherwise you pass it through. So here I get out. This is weird. Before I was getting out one. Okay, maybe. maybe that's the issue. Right, so it's not doing any correction. Hmm. 
So it's zero minus, right, that's going to be That seems wrong, right? Shouldn't, in an early step, shouldn't you, um, let's trace it again. So pre R post R, and so far this makes sense to me. So you make it negative with the first step. Um, I guess one thing I could do in my trace code is Let's see here. I was just doing this the other day, but uh, want a way to convert a number to its corresponding unsigned thing or signed thing. So I want to take um, minus. Have a mass corresponding to the number of bits, and you want to um, just do something like this. Is that right? Let me just get this working as a debugging aid. We'll need this in the future anyway. Um, so or x and u x or s x let's say print signed x n let's put this up front okay clearly I botched that so what I want to say, I want to say I guess something like this. I'm also always suspicious of Python precedents. So I want to take the least significant bits minus the negatively weighted most significant bit. Yeah, that looks right. So um, let's now use that for tracing. Dev trace. Okay. Because I can't really call this signed. Um, convert, convert 
sign or something like that. Um, and then I'm going to say um, let's see, so print this plus and I'm going to be evaluating uh, I guess I will say if signed then uh, vert signed, um, and I guess the base would be um, the width, something like this. Okay, first let's just make sure it traces. Okay, so those still seem correct, and now I want to do the trace. Um, this is the non-restoring divider. Let's see if that works. Okay. It's because the arithmetic right shift is fucking it. The arithmetic right shift is not behaving as it should. Um, I think that's the issue. Because you can see we get the minus one correctly, but then when you do the shift and it's not arithmetic. Um, I mean, it's not really hard to uh, fix that, but uh, I wouldn't probably have ever figured that out if I hadn't done this visualization, so that was a useful debug tracing tool. Um, so what we want to do is we want to do this, but arithmetically, which means that the topmost bit, um, so you want to basically drop the lowest bit, and then for the top bit, uh, replicate the sign bit. So let's do this. minus 8, and then you make this minus 4, and then from minus 4, it's plus 4, right, because 8 is the thing you're comparing to. No, it shouldn't be, it should be, oh yeah, minus 4 and then plus 4. And then we have 2, and we say that's greater than or equal to 0, so we subtract 8, and so on and so on. And for each of these Qs, right, um, Wait, was I really? Was I really shifting in the wrong direction? Jesus. Why am I even doing division? Like, I shouldn't be having to do any arithmetic shit.
minus 8 minus 16. And then you add 8, and that's minus 8. And that's minus 16 again. So now these cases work. So it's only really when we have a lot of bits that it's wrong now. Okay. That was a crazy typo. So I was just shifting R in the wrong direction for a very long time. Okay. So this is where they said we should subtract. This is where I don't, don't agree, but... Um, Yeah. So I think what I did here was right. So let's just see what the other problem is. Okay. So it says it's 2, which is clearly bogus. In this case, if I had subtracted 1, it would actually have been correct. Because it should be 0 in all these cases, of course. So let's see what actually happens here. So 0, and then minus it's nine, 9 times 8. So minus 72. And then you shift it to make it bigger and it, oh, and it went positive. So that suggests we don't have enough bits in R because it's overflowing. Let's just try putting an extra bit. This is a little bit ad hoc, but I just want to see what's going on there. So this is the same. Okay, so now we actually went further. We handle all those cases, but this is it should be a very trivial case. Um, How long have we been going? Should probably have spent more time working out this on paper. I'm going to give it 15 more minutes. If I don't uh, debug my understanding of some of this stuff, I'm just going to quit the stream and defeat, unfortunately. But um, hmm. So start with so we start with r equal to one, and this would be eight times one, so that's eight. So the first step we subtract eight. Um, and so we go with that. Then we multiply that by two. That's minus fourteen. This is less than zero, so we add eight. And so we get minus 6, and we multiply by 2, and we get that. Um, that is still negative, so we add 8. We now have that. And finally, uh, this perfectly puts it to 0. And after this, I guess we're done. And so the post queue is zero. And so if you do zero plus this, you're going to get um, minus one. And so minus one
Oh, sorry. I wasn't all the way there. Right, so this is the pre-correction Q. This is minus one. Effectively. Um, So when you add one, this is zero, which I believe is what we had. Oh, I guess this was, there, there was no correction, basically. That's why they're the same. So they pre-shift. I mean, we can try that. Yeah, I think we're going to have to to go actually think about this some more. If r is negative, then we add Add the thing, otherwise we subtract the thing. If we add the thing, we have a one here. If we subtract the thing, we have a zero. If you do this, you'd want to do this as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop uh, doing this sort of ad hoc debugging that and I should really be working it out from first principles. I thought I understood this algorithm well enough to implement it without having implemented it before. Clearly, there's some subtlety. I, I'm not sure how much of it is like me um, not having enough bits, but I think at least with the with the debugging code now, I feel like there, there's not an issue with the overflow, at least for the negative numbers. Um, 
so yeah I'll, i guess I'll, I'll figure this out uh, maybe for the next stream so i'll do some kind of makeup stream with this i wanted to actually get this out of the way quickly so i could cover newton's method based iteration but now i'm kind of all spent on this so even though the other algorithm i'm about to cover is more what people use in practice maybe but um uh and i have implemented before although not in circuits but in other contexts um so I have greater confidence I could get that to work uh, at, at, at hoc like this. But yeah, so sorry about that. Um, I guess I'll uh, I'll think about this offline and uh, mention what the bug was next stream. Um, and then maybe next stream I will also quickly run through Newton's method. I'll, I'll, I'll try to cook it. I'll try to cook it up offline so I can just do a walkthrough so you don't have to sit through me painfully debugging this stuff. So uh, sorry about that. I guess we did get the normal divider working, but I'm sorry I couldn't debug um, the non-restoring divider into existence. Uh, but I will get that done offline. So um, anyway, next week um, expect a uh, expect a shift to more sequential circuits, so registers and memories and stuff like that, and state machines. Um, but I will be doing some kind of quick follow-up on this stuff, just so um, I'll let you know what what stupid thing I, I messed up. But uh, but anyway. Uh, other than that, have a good weekend. I will be chilling here with my family. I'll be back next week for more uh, hardware stuff.